Right then, this is another video. We ain't done one in a while. Steph's caddy, as you remember, it's got this seven speed DSG, which is four wheel drive and all this carry on. And it was 380 some horsepower. Turns out that that were a bit too much and it exploded in a spectacular way. And I think Paul might have been driving it when he did that. So I don't think Steph even got as much enjoyment out of it as he wanted to and definitely Blowing it up, you get a bit of enjoyment and you realise it's going to cost you a load of money. We never quite figured out why that happened, but I did say very early on that 380 were too much. I were happy at 350s, but other people got involved and uh, we had more power. But I think if I'm going to guess anything, looking at the failure and how it happened and what happened, which it was ages ago when it happened and we just put everything in the box and forgot about it. It looks like one of the valves may be stuck open somehow. And then when that happens, you just end up with pure molten piston just wanting to exit out of the exhaust. And that seems to have been what happened. But anyway, we'll see. Uh, the, the injectors tested out fine and they're going to be going into the next build. But anyway, so that leads on to what we're going to do. Rather than doing the same thing again, we decided if we're going to do something, it needs an engine. We've not got any other car that we can do any experimenting on um, and this one we want a lot of power from it so what we decided to do we'll buy one of these engines which it looks a little bit different because rocker covers we're in the middle of doing some bits here but basically what this is this is a CUAA engine which is fitted to a few different cars Danny will put up some pictures of what they're coming but mainly the Passat 240 horsepower which normally this has got a big twin turbo setup and a massive DPF and loads of emissions crap that just make them an awful engine as far as our warranty stuff but for what we want VW have done what they did like with the V10 and the V12 and all the crazy projects that they had early on they just wanted to beat everybody at having the most powerful two litre diesel and they just completely re-engineered the engine which it's a lot nearer to the Mark 7 engine, even though it came out a bit before, really. It's a lot nearer to that than we even expected it to be. But it's that far away from it that very few of the parts are a direct upgrade for them, if uh, that makes any sense. So we'll have a quick look at this engine, a quick look at how it differs to the Mark 7 engine, which this is one of them here. We'll have a look how different they are. and. Um, then we'll talk about what the plans are and how that's going to fit into Steph's build. So the main difference when you're looking at the Passat engine to the normal Mark 7 one, which I don't know why I ain't got a picture of it, but I can't find it anyway. But the charge cooler is a lot bigger. So this portion is a lot bigger. And I can't remember the exact amount of kilowatts that this can remove from the uh, cooling system, but it's an hell of a lot. Um, I think it's about 30-40% bigger than the normal Mark 7 one. But another thing, the flange is different here, so you can't just put you can't just bolt this one onto the Mark 7 engine, which let's see if you can see. There. It's just nowhere near the same. There's just none of the bolt holes are even close to lining up. So totally different. But that's that. I think we're gonna try and retain this in the build if we don't retain it. We're probably going to just chop this flange off and then weld like a plenum on something like the Arosa, but that'll be a lot of work that we haven't really got time for. So we'll see about that. A lot of work, whatever we do. So block wise, they look very similar, but there's a few more bits on this that have not been took off. But the head is where things differ absolutely massively which I'm not going into every single component that's different but if you look inside the parts here you're straight into the inlets no messing straight in and then it, this is like the Mark 7 engine where it's got the separate cam girdle but this cam girdle doesn't fit on the Mark 7 engine either because these have got a conventional which you can all see the one the one shaft but that is the exhaust camshaft and there's a gear that drives the inlet camshaft. Now on these engines, you've not got that same arrangement. This, this is obviously looks the same, 
but this actually drives an inlet and an exhaust cam, cam lobe on each cylinder. So if you look at the inlet design, I needed my torch, where's it gone? If you look at the inlet design, absolutely, totally different seat. I don't know which one you're looking in, but if you look, you can only see one valve really. If you get right inside, I don't know. But if you look inside, they're actually behind each other. So it's a totally different setup. And that's all about emissions. That's to get a really long port that swirls in. But what they did on this by TDI engine, on the Passat engine, they've kept everything really nice and flowing. And then they got the efficiency and the emissions and all that stuff. Probably by cheating, which is why we're in this mess where diesels are all going to get banned. But they're playing the game. They find some loopholes. But the other thing that they did to increase the efficiency and make it so it would pass the emissions is they put a really high pressure injection system. So these normally run on like a 2000 bar solenoid injectors, which solenoid are a little bit slower, they don't fire as many times. They had a good one, don't get me wrong. But this had a 2,500 bar, which at the time this came out was way above everything else. Um, this some 2,700 bar and even some beyond that now. But at the time, that was like the most pressure that any common rail system had. And um, that helps with the efficiency and stuff like that. But they were piezo injectors. So it was a totally different setup. Much more expense went into this. It had a CP 4.2 pump, so the pump one more like a V6, V8 engine. Two pistons rather than one, because a single piston pump that big didn't exist. Lots and lots of different stuff. So really, really interesting engine. Loads of little tweaks. The, the pistons, crank, um, con rods, everything's different. The fasteners are all 12.9 instead of 10.9. Loads of good stuff. So the idea with this, we're trying to make this work. We're pretty, we're pretty sure that you could get this engine along with a few little changes to work in place of that, no problem. But we're gonna have to make a few tweaks to the actual engine itself to make that work in Steph's caddy because we're gonna run the old management and the old uh, solenoid injectors because they seem to work fine for what we need. Um, plus I know a guy um, who we work pretty closely with, he's done this conversion into a Mark 7 using all the wire and everything and he wished he'd never bothered. So I can see why we do it, why how we're doing it. We are giving away that really nice injection system that would just work out of the box, but what we're gonna do will probably be more reliable anyway. So should work out pretty good. So Paul's just going to finish putting all these bits together. We're just modifying the fuel pump bracket and stuff to get the CP3 to work along with this charge cooler setup. Then we're going to decide how far we go with this. I don't think we're going to open the engine up at all. Just clean it out and away you go. But these are not a cheap engine. I think it's for about three grand just for the bare engine. Luckily, we've got all these bits that we can bolt up to it and turn it into something that can be used. But... Yeah, we'll keep checking in with Paul periodically. I'm not sure if we're going to record everything he's doing because there's a lot of it's faffing about at the minute. But once we've got a base engine somewhere near, then we'll uh, we'll check back in. But the other thing, before I forget, I, did, I put it in a new right now away. This is, it's not the one, but this is the same exhaust manifold that it had on the old engine and it fits straight on, no messing. And then this would fit straight onto this as well so all the way from the mark 6 mark 7 and into this twin turbo we've got no problems fitting that i think that will just catch in on that little bit there but yeah so it should be pretty straightforward for paul to get this sorted very few bits of fabrication required i think so should work out pretty good so we're on the home stretch as far as the engine build. We've not really recorded much of what Paul's done up to now because a little bit been faffing about. But the next bit now, after he's, um, he's finished doing the wiring, we'll start recording it. So, I managed to get the cam belt on. We needed to machine this pulley to get that to work because we've had to put a cam sensor on there because normally it's there in the middle. 
just under there. So that's sorted. The only problem we've got is because we're running the water pump from a transporter, because that's not got that silly sleeve that always fails on the cars and makes them overheat. We can't run the wide timing belt. But luckily, the 240 horsepower engine has got a Kevlar reinforced belt, so this is a stronger belt, so it should be absolutely fine. I'm not too worried. We've got stretchy alternator belt because we've got rid of all the air corn and all that crap, so that should be good. GTD 28 turbos on there. We need to make up a blank for this water hose here because we're not going to have anything coming out of there. And then if you see here, we've got, I don't know where it's gone now, it's there. We've welded up the original, so that's like where the Mark 7 oil return goes. We've welded, a, welded that up, made a fitting so that that's blanked off. We need to find another blank for this oil feed, but at the minute we've got a gauge on it anyway because we want to see what the oil pressure is doing. But that's because it's normally got two turbos, so we don't need them two. And then we've, the oil drain is a lot nicer. We've been able to go to the lower turbo one, which is good. And then the oil feeds come off the usual place here as well. So that's all taken care of. The water pipes, we've pretty much got them how we want to have them. Everything's blanked off that needs to be blanked off and everything's the way it needs to go. And then these pipes, the reason these are so long is because it's such a pig to get to these fittings when the charge cools on. So we're gonna sort them. The only other thing we are waiting on is the adapter from this part to the boost pipe. So when that is machined, we'll get that made up. Um, but we're probably gonna get it in the car before we do that because it's not a massive job to do. Uh, i trying to think if there's anything else. The fuel pump's on there. Took a little bit more bending of this pipe because this is quite a bit bigger. Yeah, injectors have all gone in fine. So yeah, everything seems to be all right. So unless we've forgotten something massively, I think we should be all right. So Paul's got it in. Not got really much footage of what he was doing because he'd have been fed up if I asked him to do all this bits and bats and have a camera following him round. So first thing, I'll show you it does actually start. Ignore the squealing, the battery's dead and the alternator belt's a little bit too long, but that's by the by. So everybody who we've spoke to who doesn't know tons about what we're doing they said this would not work don't know how you get it to work it'd be too much work to get it to do but an engine's just an air pump everything else the control the management everything as long as you've got all the sensors where they need to be should work so we've done what we need to do obviously we've talked about that and it's worked obviously we said we're going to keep the charge cooler if we can come up with a decent solution which i think we have a few blanks here and there because it's easier to do that and we might have to use them for bleeders and stuff. A little bit of playing about with a map sensor wiring because obviously we've got separate map sensor and temperature sensor here. Leaving this temperature sensor for now but we can just plug that onto there and see what's happening pre and post charge cooler so that'll be some good interesting information. While we're on the charge cooler, ignore that these are not bottled up properly because they're going to be going to the sides here but we need to get the bumper back on to do that. Or maybe Steph's going to sort that. And we need to just trim these pipes down when that's done. But what you can see is going on here, instead of the intercooler, we've got this radiator, which is absolutely soft as anything. Dints so easy, can't even touch it. But what this is, is an SDI radiator. Flip the other way around, just so these outlet, inlet and outlet are not shoving into the big, fig aluminium radiator that we had custom made for this, which is full height. That's why it looks a lot bigger. But also, the SDI radiators fit like a TDI intercooler. So that's got the pegs that locate it into the bottom of the slam panel and the bolts that go through to hold it all in. And then we've been able to bracket off that to make the radiator all together. Otherwise, we're gonna to have to make some very elaborate brackets or weld some more stuff to the radiator and then push everything forward. Because you do want, I don't like how we've got these oil coolers in front. That's why they're going to the sides. But you do want this charge cooler radiator to the front because the air in this should, the water in this, sorry, should only be 
30 or 40 degrees or we're, we're going to try and get it down to less than 30 40 degrees if we can the water in obviously the radiator is going to be pushing air through it that might be 100 120 degrees into this if we had it behind so you always try and have the cooler things at the front and it gets hotter and hotter and hotter so really your oil cool should be at the back but generally to get what you want from that you need a massive oil cool so sometimes they end up in front but anyway forgetting about that that's the fundamentals of how it should work this should do what we need to do it's been a lot more work some horrible reducers that i don't really like but we're gonna have to live with them bit messy on the pipework side of things which is the negative of a charge cool you get a really nice simple boost pipe which is literally just straight it's 45 90 degree bend 45 bend 45 bend and that's it that's the boost pipe set up so you're not gonna have any leaky boost pipes but then you end up with a potential issue with a charge cooler and on a cold winter's day I wouldn't have thought we'd be able to get the charge temps down as much as an intercooler but there's a certain tipping point I'm sure somebody else cleverer than me knows when that is but the charge cooler wasn't chosen on these engines because it were better or because it's easier to manipulate the temperatures to make the DPF regen which is not our concern but we wanted to test it out see in the real world how good these charge cores are plus it saved us a day or two trying to make an inlet manifold which at some point we're going to have to do it but we can do that at our leisure now rather than to get this project up and running so we'll see stop talking crap about that but yeah basically this engine is a 240 horsepower per sat engine it's running on 140 170 whatever you want to be c46 ecu which is the older edc 17 same as what we run in all our cars so we we've got a good understanding of how that works and we can take away stuff we don't need this one is a little bit different because steph's cad is based on the tiguan so it's got a lot of weird stuff that like the golf engine has not got like a separate fuel pump control and stuff like that and it's just a bit different obviously we've been dsg how it starts and stuff a bit weird but we had 380 horsepower before i always said it were too much if we can get a nice clean low egt 350 this project's a success because that engine's totally stock and it's going to allow it'd be nice if it allows that but we're going to get what we can get we can't get any more than that i don't think steph wants to start stripping this engine down and trying to pour it out more and coating pistons and stuff like that it, it'd be nice if we didn't have to and um, whether this is going to be the engine that eventually ends up in our golf if we have a problem with the engine that's in at the minute or we want to go upper class or we might have some more race cars potentially happening and this would be the engine that we put in if it all goes to plan so let's see this is experimental i don't think anybody else has done this before um, at least not with the OE management anyway so we can only see what we can do the next video should be a dyno So we finally got it on the dyno, but that was yesterday, so it's just come off now this morning. They couldn't wait. They've got another car they want to get on, so I need to hurry up and do this video. But as you can see, the power is pretty good. 351, and then the 326 you see, that's the track tune, but we've yet to test these on the road. So literally the only difference between these two, which would drop in probably 75. Well, 50 foot pounds, something like that, maybe 60 foot pounds, and 25 horsepower. That's literally taking just a bit of fuel out, but that lowers EGTs by around 100, 105 degrees. So, quite significant. Whether it's enough or too much, we'll see when we get it on the road. The figures are probably a little bit lower than I'd want them to be. We had more than that before, but it didn't end well. So I think if we, um, there's still more to be done. We've not extracted everything out of this that we possibly can, but this is running cooler than it was before 
when everything were working properly. And it's um, spooling pretty good. A little bit of low end work we want to do, but we're going to try and do that on the road because we've been four wheel drive, it's on the dyno. Don't want to run it for too long. Really could have done with taking the prop shaft off if we're going to have it on for a long time, but the workshop's absolutely rammed. So we'll go for a drive in it, and I think that'll probably be the end of this video, but we'll see. But everything that you need to know about this engine and gearbox and caddy spec will all be in the description and there'll be a link to our website so anything that you can purchase is there don't be asking us any more questions about fitting this engine into your car because unless we're doing it it'd be a bit of a pain um so yeah let's go for a run see what happens so right i best go i've got cameras on me ignore matisse's ugly face he's just here to try and make me look prettier um this seat saddle absolutely crap I didn't even know how you'd adjust it. Oh, there. So, we're finally out in Steph's caddy. It's missing its paddles. Oil pressure, yeah, engine. That's what engages, yeah. yeah. So Oil pressure. Sensor. Yeah, sensor's fine. So, the oil pressure is fine. Ignore that. Another dead squirrel. Squirrel! There are issues that need addressing like say the steering wheel and stuff like that but it's been in bits for a while so we've got things to sort it feels like it drives nice just cruising along in drive it's pretty good very noisy i don't know if we're missing a bit of sound ending in back need to get this back on track Changing up early in drive, innit? Well, that's how it's meant to be. Not too early. That feels pretty quick. Smoke output. This is on the 350 tune, innit? Yeah. Smoke output, a little bit on spool, but nothing too crazy. We'll put it in sport for the next blip, see what it feels like. We're doing 50 mile an hour because we're stuck behind a Land Rover 90. The pickup tech feels really good. Put it to spot. It's got full throttle. Pretty good smoke out, looks good. I put it to manual, in fact, I want to see what it feels like at low RPM. Yeah. So that's foot flat down at 1500. Definitely laggy. on spool to be done. Smoke's absolutely mint. Only real smoke I saw when I tipped in in drive. Feels like no drama. <laughs> quick, that in it. <laughs> Can't ask for better between gears, can you? Very happy with that for an initial road test. Can I ask for more? So, 
very, very happy. Just going to work on that low end spool if we can. Just try and make it. It's not like you'd ever really need it with an automatic, but on the motorways, when you just want to feed it in without kicking down five gears, it might be a bit annoying. So we shall see. Fix the steering wheel, fix all the lights on the dash that shouldn't be on, which is going to be pretty easy to sort with the forks. We had it like that before. And uh, get rid of the oil pressure gauge now. We know it's all all right. So, yeah, we shall see. Yeah, something's happening. It's all clear again. Yeah. So, thank you for watching. Next time you see this, it'll probably be either on a track or um, at a show.